Today I'm going to talk about genetic basis of individual variation in spatial cognitive abilities in uh, food caching chickadees, which is a big uh, collaborative project with Dr. Scott Taylor from uh, University of Colorado Boulder, led by Carrie Branch. Understanding how cognitive abilities evolve remains one of the important questions in evolutionary biology. Animal exhibits large variation in cognitive abilities, both within and between species, but cognition also is a very flexible trait that may be affected by development, environment, and individual experiences. At the same time, our understanding of heritability of cognitive traits on their genetic basis remains poor. For cognitive abilities to be affected by natural selection, we mainly need three conditions to be met. First, individual variation should exist, which is well documented. Second, such variation should be heritable, which is poorly known. And third, the variation should have fitness consequences, also poorly known at this point. Food caching species present a great system to investigate evolution of cognition and more specifically, specifically spatial cognition. Uh, Skitter hoarding species rely on spatial cognition to recover numerous food caches, and we're talking about tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of scattered food caches. Uh, food caches are critical for winter survival. Not being able to access uh, their food caches will result in uh, mortality. Spatial cognition is necessary for recovery of food caches, and hence it is necessary for overwinter survival. So our main hypothesis that we've been working on for a long time now is that harsher winter environment should lead to more reliance on food caches, and hence it should lead to more reliance on spatial cognition for survival. After showing that winter environment is indeed associated with differences in spatial cognition and hippocampal morphology in black-capped chickadees on a continental scale, our work was focused on investigating on winter climate and spatial cognition on a small spatial scale along an elevation gradient in mountain chickadees. Winter conditions change drastically along an elevation gradient, but such differences are not gradual. Uh, the biggest changes occur above the snow line. Snow line, which varies in elevation between mountain ranges, indicates elevation above which most winter precipitation comes as snow and below as rain. But most importantly, the strength and severity of snowstorms are much higher above the snow line, resulting in rather harsh winter conditions for the chickadees. On the right, you can see conditions at high elevation, the top photo, and low elevation at the bottom photo on the same day, May 31st, 2017, almost six feet of snow depth at high elevation still. While there's some gene flow between elevations, chickadees are highly resident, and we have not documented a single bird that hatched at one elevation and bred at a different elevation, despite banning thousands of nestlings over the last eight years. Given such drastic changes in winter conditions above the snow line, we expect the strength of selection on spatial cognition needed to recover caches to be stronger above the snow line, as caches are likely to be much more critical for winter survival at high elevation. A comparison of chickadees from high and low elevation in the lab, done by Cody Fries, who was a master's student in my lab, indeed documented significant differences both in spatial learning and memory and in the hippocampus morphology between high and low elevation. On the picture on the right, you can see uh, a picture of neurons at high elevation, low elevation, and you should be able to see easily that there are way more neurons uh, and there are bigger neurons at high elevation compared to low elevation. Following our comparative lab-based studies, we have established a novel RFID-based system of measuring spatial learning and memory abilities in wild chickadees in their natural environment. We use a radial maze analog with eight feeders positioned equidistantly on a square frame suspended above the ground. We program our FID feeder so that each bird has to learn spatial location of the only feeder that would provide food to this particular bird, and we measure the number of errors or incorrect feeders visited as the bird learns the location of the rewarding feeder. Using this method, we're able to measure spatial learning and memory in hundreds of birds. Using this field system, we were able to show that spatial learning and memory in mountain chickadees is indeed under natural selection, as in juvenile birds in their first winter, variation in spatial learning and memory abilities was associated with differences in overwinter survival. Only the juveniles with better spatial cognition survived their first winter. A critical question now is whether individual variation in spatial cognitive abilities is heritable and has genetic basis. To address this question, we selected 42 chickadees from both high and low elevation uh, based on their cognitive performance. We selected the best birds at both high and low elevation and not so good birds from both high and low elevation. While there was no overlap between the groups, there was continuous distribution connecting these two groups rather than all birds in each group having identical performance. On this graph, you can see the distribution of selected birds based on their cognitive performance on the left 
And on the right, you can see how these selected birds fit into the overall distribution of all birds that we have tested. The selected birds have black outline and their symbols. The key thing here is also that you can see that the birds uh, with not so good performance were not just some uh, outliers, but they actually were representative of a pretty large part of the natural distribution. We have uh, sequenced full genomes of these birds and aligned them to the reference genome of the black-capped chickadee. And we use two methods to look for potential differences in genomes based on individual variation and spatial uh, cognitive abilities. First, uh, we use the genome-wide association analysis, GWAS, uh, by using GEMMA, genome-wide efficient mixed model analysis. And second, we also used a machine learning approach using random forest analysis. Both analyses identified many significant differences associated with variation in cognitive phenotype, as you can see on these graphs. The top graph shows results of the GEMMA, or GWAS analysis, and the bottom graph shows results of the machine learning random forest analysis. On both graphs, the black or gray outline of the symbols indicates the outliers picked by both analyses uh, simultaneously. Overall, 52 loci were identified as outliers by both GEMMA and random forest, despite the drastically different algorithms implemented in those different analyses. The most important thing is that genome-wide efficient mixed model analysis showed that genetic variation explained 92% of individual variation in spatial cognitive ability. Where are these differences in gen genome located? The GO analysis identified up to 22 categories with significant overrepresentation and connections specifically to neurological functions, including neuron growth and development. What is striking here is that the distribution of GOA categories is very similar between the GEMMA on the left and random forest on the right. The, bu the bubble size here indi indicates uh, the number of genes in each category. And you can see numerous categories associated with neuronal development and neurogenesis. Uh, when we zoom into the subset of genomic regions containing some of the most significant associations, we can see that individual outlier loci showed variable patterns of association with gene features and were located in non-coding regions in the vicinity of the genes, as well as within protein coding regions. Overall, the differences detected in our study mostly concern genes associated with neural development. It is likely that these genetic differences lead to different wiring of the hippocampus on the brain during development, uh, which then produce uh, different spatial cognitive abilities. Such differences match very well with all of our previous work, showing that population differences in spatial cognition are associated with significant differences in hippocampus volume, the total number of hippocampal neurons, and hippocampal neurogenesis rates. Now, if we connect the dots with all of our data, we can see that there, are, there is individual variation in spatial cognition and the hippocampus morphology. Uh, we know that there are survival consequences of individual variation in spatial learning and memory, and now we're showing that individual variation in spatial cognitive abilities is associated with large genetic variation, which explains more than 90% of variation in cognition. So all of this supports natural selection and population differences as local adaptations to environment. Thank you for listening, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and here's all the people participating in the study on National Science Foundation. Uh, supporting uh, all of our work.